Good afternoon, everybody. We don't care. My name is Cleo Martin, and it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the fall follow-up conference of the Iowa Writing Project. There is no way that I can possibly tell you how moving an experience this is for me to look out over this audience and recognize that you're here primarily because of your dedication to two things. One, to the writing process, and two, to kids, and three, perhaps, to bringing those two things together. So I congratulate you. Uh, for that professionalism and that uh, whole set of attitudes that seems to predominate in the Iowa Writing Project. I wish with all my heart that every person who said a negative thing about education could stand right here right now and look at your faces and know your quality. So I, I certainly want to begin with that emphasis. We're proud of, it, proud of every one of you. I can't help thinking, of course, of October 1978 when we had the first follow-up conference of the Iowa Writing Project. And there were 24 participants. Uh, they were huddled in a little motel dining room near Iowa City. Uh, we invited everybody we could think of to come who we thought might come. And our total <laughs> attendance, if I exaggerate a little bit, was 50 people. Uh, from those humble beginnings, as you know, the project has grown and expanded and become increasingly exciting. At that time, we talked quite a bit about whether or not there'd be enough teacher interest to have some sessions in 1980. Um, we really worried about that. We didn't know whether it was gonna go or not. And it certainly is the dedication of people just like you who maintained the project and increased its vitality over the years. There are many people that I am welcoming you on behalf of. Is that a good sentence? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's clear, we understand. <laughs> uh, in fact, the list would be so long if I went through the whole bit that uh, Donald Gray, Donald Murray, I do that all the time. Yeah, so is everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> is that a compliment or an insult? That's I don't a compliment know. to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the first time I pulled that boner. Um, the list of people is so long that uh, Donald Murray wouldn't have a chance to talk if I went through the whole list. And I'm reminded at this point of a story of a seventh grade kid who was asked to do a report, an oral report, and uh, the student stood up very eagerly and excitedly and said, there are 5,000 kinds of tropical fish. The first is... <laughs> <laughs> My acknowledgments would certainly have to include at least 5,000. Um, but I welcome you in behalf of the University of Iowa, English Department, Department of Public Instruction, a number of AEAs, the steering committee of the project, the advisory board of the project, a number of local school districts who've helped finance projects. Um, certainly, specifically, I welcome you on behalf of Jim Davis, our project director, and we all know of his untiring efforts. Uh, on behalf of all the teaching staff, I noticed this morning that the number of teachers now exceeds the number of participants in the first project. There are more teachers than there were participants in the first round. Uh, you'll meet Jim tonight. You'll meet the teaching staff individually tonight. Certainly the reception of the project here at Amana has been uh, various. Uh, Donald Graves said last year it reminded him more of a family reunion than a conference. And I thought that was nice. At the same, in the same year, I think it was, I was walking down the hall with a few people and some anonymous person says, said, here comes some more of those damn writers. <laughs> 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 I don't know to take that as a compliment or an insult, but we'll let that pass. Um, anyway, I hope that you all have a wonderful, rewarding experience here, and it's certainly uh, great to see each and every one of you. My second honor and pleasure is to introduce a wonderful person to my left. She has come to be known by me as the wonderful Sandra Bolton. I don't know whether she thinks that's a compliment or not, but uh, Sandra was in our Level 1 project in 1979. She has since taken level two and three. I think she even took them in the right order. Some people take one, three, and two. Sandra took one, two, and three, I think. Sandra's now working on her PhD at the University of Iowa. I'm pleased to say she's also a member of our rhetoric program teaching staff. And as most of you know, she's also president of the Iowa Council of Teachers of English. This is Sandra Bolton.
Thank you, Leo. On behalf of the Iowa Council of Teachers of English, I would like to extend a warm welcome to each of you. It is an honor to introduce our guest today. His teaching and writing have had a profound impact on us and on our profession here in Iowa and across the country. If we are using the writing conference in our teaching, we have probably been encouraged by our guest's listening eye and the knowledge that he conducts 60 to 70 conferences a week. Since 1963, that adds up to a total of 37,000 writing conferences. <laughs> I've done the arithmetic for you. <laughs> If we are liberating our students and ourselves to feel the motivating force of revision and to experience that discovery and surprise so essential to reader and writer, the chances are we have learned from our guest's perception of his own writing process. And if we are doing more sitting than standing and more listening than talking in our classrooms, we have undoubtedly been relieved by such statements of our guest as, each year I teach less and less and my students learn more. And I must be responsible and not do the work that belongs to my students. Our guest has written numerous articles and books on the teaching of writing that include, A Writer Teaches Writing, Learning by Teaching, Write to Learn, and Read to Write. He has also written over 200 freelance articles that have appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, Reader's Digest, and other national magazines. In 1954, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for freelance editorials. He has been a contributing editor to Time, was consultant to newspaper staffs such as the Boston Globe, and has conducted workshops for news editors and writers. Last week, my freshman rhetoric students wrote letters to the author of their writing text. One said, I'm glad you entitled your book, Write to Learn, instead of Learn to Write. <laughs> I'm still used to high school writing textbooks that told me exactly how to write. Your book suggests rather than commands. This is one college text that I'm not taking back to the bookstore. <laughs> Another wrote, the points that interested me most are that writing is thinking and that writers never really know what they're going to say when they begin. Finally, a third wrote, and I love her opening phrase, as a fellow writer, she begins, <laughs> I know it must have taken quite a bit of courage to expose some of your own writing for others to read and critique. I'm going to keep this book and use it. Who knows, maybe someday I'll write one of my own. <laughs> a tribute to our guest would not be complete without saying a word about his wife, Minnie Mae, and her invaluable contribution to his work, which I think this story illustrates. When he was preparing to drive from the East Coast to the University of Wyoming, where he, where he would be teaching for a year, he was worried about all that lost writing time. So a typewriter was installed on the passenger side of the car, <laughs> and Minnie Mae typed eight hours a day <laughs> while her husband dictated. When they arrived, they had 155 pages of copy. <laughs> Please welcome with me the University of New Hampshire's professor of English, whom Donald Graves calls our giant back here, Donald Murray. here, all the different things. I mean, it wasn't eight hours a day. I mean, I, <laughs> I couldn't write eight hours a day. It uh, came out to about uh, uh, four pages uh, uh, an hour. I haven't figured out the mileage, about eight pages a day. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, I should continue the uh, Minnie Mae isn't here. I hope she's been with me before in a lot of trips, and this one she isn't along. But uh, I would not be a writer uh, without her. And that's something that I think is maybe important to mention. 
Uh, my confidence uh, as a writer was such that until I married her, and she's my second wife, <laughs> I uh, would write a lot and then I would heroically and romantically throw it away and burn it. Uh, she comes from a background that uh, people in Amana will understand, uh, a German background where you use the nose and the tail and the foot of the pig as well as the prime cuts. And uh, she couldn't see any reason to throw away perfectly good manuscripts and so she started mailing them out and they started getting accepted. So uh, I really do uh, owe everything to her. Uh, she's my best friend and, and we, in my writing, she's all involved in this. She's a very good writer herself. Uh, she's published everything she's written, but she's only written about four things. And you find you can't motivate other people to write. I can't get her to write enough. Uh, rather frustrating, as a matter of fact. But I think we have that experience with our students and colleagues who we know could be writers, but have the discretion and not to become one. <laughs> uh, particularly glad to be in Iowa, because some of you may not realize the reputation you have in writing, but you're seen as one of the central places in the country and have been for years in what's going on in composition. Uh, you've provided many leaders for us in other parts of the country, and uh, I'm honored and pleased to be out here and to meet so many more of you, those of you I've known, and uh, it's been a wonderful visit. Uh, we're going to start out by demonstrating some conferences uh, Jim Davis has agreed to be a student, and I've agreed with a great deal of nervousness uh, to be a teacher. <laughs> and uh, we're going to try to do a few conferences uh, to have a, to set a context of, uh, of at least participation by observation. Now this will be show then tell, I guess. So. <laughs> one mic that you need, and the other one. He thinks he's nervous. We haven't, I haven't seen any of the manuscripts, and we will do several conferences and we'll find out how we do. I probably should explain that if you're a conference teacher, I don't try to win every conference. I try not to even use that kind of image or language. Uh, if I were, I'd be perfectly okay if I batted about you know, one out of three. If I batted one out of three and played in the American League, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> so I'm not worried about whether it works or not. What I'm worried about is that the, with the demonstration will be revealing to you. We need to sit down to do this, or do you? I'll try it standing up. Okay. I've never done a standing up conference, <laughs> but if we, if we'll, we'll disappear out of camera range. <laughs> What we're trying to do at this point, as I understand it, is uh, model conferences at about three different points in the semester. And the, the first conference, I'm trying to come in as um, a student early in the semester. Um, perhaps even the first conference with uh, Donald Murray. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm scheduled for um, a conference today. Spontaneously, we have all our students wired in this school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I came to college to get wired. <laughs> so, um, what, what did you say your name was? Uh, Jim Davis. Right. And you're a freshman? Yes. Yeah. Where do you, where'd you come from? Where's your home? From uh, the southwest Missouri Ozarks. Oh. I've never been down in that country. But pretty good country. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> I'm yeah. fond of it, yeah. very much so. Yeah. Why'd you take the writing course? Well, I've always wanted to write and um, haven't really done much writing in school, uh, through high school. Yeah, a lot of schools don't allow that um, kind of activity. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, I've, what I did do in school, I wasn't very interested in um, the, any writing I care about. I think I've, um, I've largely done outside of school. Um, haven't really shown much of it to a teacher. Yeah. Have you got some of that outside of school writing with you? Well, I brought, uh, I brought one piece that we could look at okay. today. Um, 
Looks like a poem from over here. Um, I think it is. Um, <laughs> I hope it's all right to, to bring poetry to these conferences and yeah, write poetry yeah, in this class. I might even show some of my own to you, and then you'd really okay. suffer. Good. <laughs> Good. Before you read it, I'd like to know what you think of it. You. I'm pretty pleased with it at this okay. at this point. I've uh, I've worked on it quite a bit. I think there's still a little I could do probably, but I'm I'm pleased with some of the things it yeah. does. Okay. Do you want to look at it? Or? Uh, well, uh, I think here would be good if I heard you read it. And, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, the poem is entitled Matthew. Okay. The youngest and centerpiece of a four generation family breakfast at the spring house. Protested when his mother saved him from her too hot coffee. Wanted his own adult cup to show her. Attractive, pensive, frustrated, she took him from the table. Conversation swirled on in their absence. She's lost so much weight. Can't wear her clothes, compete with a younger woman. Snatches of life served with eggs and hash browns and toast. Doing what's best for someone else, a thankless job at any age. Yeah, I like that. Um, you gonna write some more stuff like that for me? I, I can try. I don't know whether I have any more in me or not. <laughs> um, but maybe that's the that's the kind of thing I'm interested okay, in. Okay. Well, let's bring more in next time. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay, a second conference um, later in the later in the semester. Hi, Don. I'm scheduled for another conference today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that makes my day. I've been I've, wondering what I was doing here. I thought <laughs> I thought you never were going to get that last person out of here. <laughs> She was writing nice stuff, though. I, yeah. you know, I heard some of what you were talking about, but yeah. well, you can see why well, I have it lasted a long time. Students come in and sit, and they sometimes learn a little more when their own stuff isn't under under consideration. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Yeah. Good. Well, what you got for me today? Well, I, I brought one that I've been working on. Um, it, it kind of um, happened to me in a, in a class the other day. Um, you know, another class we were we were being taken through a. I guess an exercise, I don't know what you'd call it, but um, it was supposed to be a four-step exercise and on about step two, um, this poem started happening and I don't know what the other two steps were, but uh, I went with the poem instead and the teacher wasn't too happy, but um, um, the poem's underway anyway. I, there's problems with it, but you know, it's a shot. Behind breastworks, he clutched a powder flask, measured grains of pain and grams of death into a blue-gray bore. Unaimed, arose to roar, to fire, but took a mini-ball into his open mouth and threw a jaw, fought on for future tending. Later still grew an enduring beard to hide the scar. Behind a divided house on my stone patio, I caress a bronze measure from another time. Raised flower beds, block by block, temporary shield from contemporary woes. In solitude, to dress less honored wounds. What, uh, what do you like about it? Well, I like the fact that it's, um, first of all, that it's, that it's about a great-grandfather um, I never knew. I saw his picture one time that I can remember of, and I remember the beard, and um, 
I finally found out about why he grew the beard. And then when my grandfather died, um, because of my interest in the Civil War, they gave me a little bronze measuring device that he had carried all the way through the Civil War to measure powder and shot for his muzzle-loading yeah. gun. And I still have that. And in this activity, I was reminded of it and started putting a couple of, of things together. The images started working. So I like what it's about. And I like some of the parallelism in the structure. Yeah. But I guess the thing I'm uncomfortable with is I think it's a little obscure. You know, I, I think it means more to me than it does to a reader, maybe. Yeah. I, I don't know. How, how did you read it? Well, I guess it started me thinking about uh, a fellow I'm indirectly named for, great, great, great uncle, I guess, that fought at Waterloo. And the Donald Morrison part of my name has passed along through the family. And uh, when I went overseas to go in World War II, my grandmother thought I was the uncle that had been at Waterloo that she knew as a little girl, kind of gave me a sense of history. So. Yeah. You want to be perfectly honest, I kind of went off and did the same thing you did. I started writing my <laughs> poem. <laughs> and, uh, you want to read the rest of mine? <laughs> well, yeah, I'd like to keep it. I'd like to keep it and look at it and get back to you tomorrow or something if you can come okay. by. Maybe I'll show you my version and uh, we can do that. What do you intend to do next with it? Do you have any idea? I don't know. I don't want to change anything until I'm sure of, of what I'm doing. I, you know, I don't want to revise out of it some of the stuff I like in yeah. it. Yeah. You know. You know. Well, do you mind if I mess with it? If uh, mark anything on there or not? If I feel to like it when I get in there. No, I have another copy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. <laughs> All right. As long as you don't take me too seriously. Fine. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Another conference uh, toward the end of the semester. Well, I've got a problem today, Don. Good. Um, <laughs> I was worried about yeah. writing being too easy for you. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, I've seen your stuff. You know better than that. Um, I've got a I've got a poem, but I don't have a draft of it yet. Yeah. It's you know it started happening last night, and um, you know one of those things I can't do anything about it but I don't have time to write it down, so it's not there yet. I jotted down, uh, well, actually, as I drove up this morning, I jotted down yeah. some lines. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of things that I was going to get to, but I lost them right behind the truck. <laughs> and, um, that was so, you. <laughs> yeah, well, it was close. <laughs> it was close. I've, it was a good line. I'm not sure about the trade-off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, it's kind of a painful poem, is that all right? It's all right. Um, I don't know how I'll handle it, but um, let's, let's talk about what I'm trying to do, and maybe you can, maybe you can help me with it a little bit. Um, I got a call yesterday morning, and uh, um, you know, one of those 5.30 in the morning calls that you can't wake up for and you know is trouble. Yeah. Um, and my mother's in the hospital. Um, Sorry to hear that. Well, they thought she had a heart attack, but I think now it looks like she, you know, probably didn't. It's uh, it's Good. not quite that yeah. serious. But um, last last night, then it reminded me of um, of something I had jotted down in uh, in an earlier journal. So I went back and dug out uh, dug out the earlier journal, and I and I I'd, I'd just gotten down an image from. Uh, you know, the house I grew up in and, and where my parents still live. And then uh, later last night, they called again, and I talked to my brother about it, and uh, it's this kind of started becoming a, a poem. But it's not even close to a draft. It's just, um, it's just some phrases. Um, let me do as much as I can of what's in my head with it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, Afternoon sun slanted through the picture window of our living room at home. 
squares in the window frame casting blocks on the floor and on the east wall like an archaeologist plot marked off for careful digging. But the sun moves and I, unlike Joshua, move with it. Besides, that living room was an image. Not there did we live our lovingly destructive lives. That's as, that's as far as I've gotten with it yeah. at this point, so. Well, I'd keep following language. Uh, some of the conferences, you've worried a little bit whether people understand you, and when we were first writing, I think we try to tell people how to feel or worry about their feelings. You can't do that. You just got to get right there and let me feel it and then see what happens. I, I, I just like to have you follow that language wherever it takes you or follow your eye or your ear. Well, you, you know from some of my other stuff that I've written a lot about my father mm. and um, it hit me last night that I've not written much about, about my mother. Um, kind of the reverse of roles in your writing and, yeah. in, and in your life in, in some ways. But one of the things I worry about with this is, um, you know, where it may be going and what I may be shying away from and how do you handle writing about painful things with people still alive who don't need, you know, really to be told of things they can't do anything about? Well, first of all, I probably wouldn't show it to them. Uh, I took my father, who was in the retail business, to see Death of a Salesman, which was one of the most cruel things a young, <laughs> young arrogant college student could do. <laughs> sort of learn from that. <laughs> uh, but I think you've, you know, you've got to follow where you're going, but if it doesn't feel good, I wouldn't do it. Uh, remember when Julie was writing about uh, her sister that died, I kept telling her in conference and in classes, you remember that don't write about this if it if it's painful to you, but if it feels good, which is a funny term, we don't know what language, but if it's healthy, you know whether it's healthy or not, do it. If it isn't healthy, do something else. Wait for its time. I, its time's gonna come. And it may be now and it may not be now. How do you become a poet? Well, I don't know. Uh, you guess you write poetry, which you're already doing. Then you send it out. <laughs> That's the scary part, isn't it? Sending it out. I think the scary part's not writing it. Yeah, I stopped right. writing for a long time, and when my father died, I started writing. I realized I hadn't been writing poetry, and, and I was going to get out of this world someday, and I wasn't going to have done that. So I think it's much scarier not to write it than write it. Does this thing sound like it could go anywhere to you? Yep. Sure is scary stuff. Well, thanks. I'll see you okay. next week. Good. Thank you. It takes a lot of courage to do that. And thank you, Jim. It's, uh, thank you. And, uh, interesting as all of you you get to know a person better when you when you see their work uh, those conferences were typical of a kind of tone and a kind of attitude and I'll talk a lot about it in theory theoretical terms and very practical terms in the next few minutes uh, but it was typical of what goes on it's also typical I should uh, say of what goes on from first grade through with professionals of writers talking to writers back and forth. Um, I go into elementary schools a lot because of Don Graves' work, Jane Hansen's work, and uh, kids will come over to me and say, hey, I'd like to have you look at my lead. <laughs> or I think I got something here, I don't know if it's a poem or not. And, <laughs> and uh, it's, the language is a little different. The furniture in elementary schools is different. I, <laughs> 
uh, if you're if you're overweight by an entire other person, uh, <laughs> pretty discouraging to try to get down on that furniture. <laughs> but, but, uh, what we've been doing is response teaching. My preparation for this was my own writing this morning and my writing other mornings and my reading this morning and some quiet time and seeing some human beings and being alive. Uh, I just wanted to be as ready and concentrated to forget as much as possible that you were here, that the camera were here, the lights were here, and that I was concentrating intensely on him and on the text, but in that order. <laughs> the reason for response teaching is demonstrated this morning. I don't know. I knew Jim as a, an educator. I've met him at meetings, know his reputation. Uh, I knew him as the person who invited me, did all those things, picked me up, the plane, got me here, fed me. <laughs> I knew his reputation with other people, but I didn't know him as a writer, and now I know him as a writer. There's no way I could prepare for this conference. There's no way I can prepare for any of my students. Uh, I find myself prejudiced at times, although I went to college on a football scholarship when I have a student with no neck, I tend to think that there's no brains there. <laughs> and uh, it may be the usual stimuli, you know, the prejudices that we, that we have. Uh, I don't know what they know. I don't know what the students need to know. There is no content in the traditional sense. There is nothing that I feel I have to tell people. I see my own textbooks as a resource for students that are used differently, as some of the students have indicated and they can get from that, but I don't think there's anything they have to know. There's no absolute sequence of what they need. Uh, you can hear what happened uh, because Jim chose to have it happen and it, it makes a good reason. He felt insecure, so he showed me a finished poem first and got to the rough drafts last. Uh, that's not the way we sequence things, is it? We demand rough stuff first and final stuff last. You know, he reversed the writing process. And what should I do? I think I should do what I do is take what I've got, take the student where the student is, listen to the student, listen to the text, respond as a human being as best I can. The student initiates, this was freshman English. In our university, I would have had to say the second week, I don't think I would have said it the first week, I would have had to say that although I write poetry myself, we can only write nonfiction. And although I realize there's something called the nonfiction poem that these sound like, <laughs> I can't have him uh, putting his prose in a funny arrangement on the page for the grade in the course. Uh, but I'm very happy to read his poetry and very happy to have him write some prose too. And I think you'd understand that. Well, the student would pick the, pick the topic, produce a draft. This is very revolutionary stuff. Uh, a friend of all of us, Phyllis Shafley, apparently had <laughs> Heads up an outfit that has uh, just attacked some school systems in New Hampshire. Get yourself ready if you haven't been ready for it. There is a group that's had quite an effect, I understand, in Arizona that is fighting the idea of topic choice by students, uh, posing and has succeeded in some school systems with letter writing to school committees that students are not allowed to pick their own topic, their own genre, or their own conclusions. Uh, we will have to fight that one uh, as best we can. What are the responsibilities of the student in this kind of teaching? One, to find a territory to explore. And let's not assume that they're all personal and family territories. I have one class in which nobody is writing personal stuff this semester. Five people are writing fashion in that class. <laughs> I have never had a student since 1963 write a single story about, story about fashion, and now I have five in one class. Uh, absolutely amazes me. Uh, I have an enormous disinterest in fashion. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just perfect because they are educating me and I'm in the ideal situation. It's much better when I don't know about the subject. I tend to feel that horses are badly trained dogs uh, and that my experience with horses and what they leave around have led me to feel that the automobile was a big step forward. <laughs> but I have lots of students that educate me about horses and it's wonderful. Uh, they want, I want my students to explore it in writing. It's a writing course, so they have to do this in writing, although a lot of writing is oral, particularly in the beginning. They have to evaluate that exploration. In other words, they have to find out what they're discovering. They have to share and use the resource of fellow writers 
which includes the teacher and the classmates. They have to help others during their sharing, and this is very important because then they see writing in process, which is very good. As I mentioned in my conferences, I, the students sign up for a regular time, 15 minutes in my case, uh, at the university, and they come to the door whenever they get there, and they come on in and sit in another chair, uh, and uh, we have, if the student or if I don't want them there, I wave them out. But most of the time, uh, they come and sit and they hear the other conferences and they learn a little more than that. Uh, they continue to explore all the new territories. I don't require revision, but I allow it. And uh, they keep writing. And whether or not Jim will write about his mother now or 10 years from now, we do not know. Jim does not know, so I certainly can't know. The responsibility of the teacher is to write, and I made myself preparing for this, not just prepare this talk as I got up early this morning and rewrote all this stuff, but I made myself work a little bit on a novel just as a kind of purifying experience, just as saying this is my writing, this is, puts me in the, re re I'm more receptive of other people's writing if I've done my own. My job is to create a climate where exploration is irresistible. And uh, you create the climate in many ways. I was, I feel as a teacher, I was helping to create the climate here. To Although I was nervous and my hands were shaking, I was trying to be comfortable as I could and relaxed and to admit my nervousness, which allows the other person to whatever is appropriate. I try to, in my office, I have a big, uh, clock that I got with green stamps. <laughs> That's where I can see it on the wall, but the students can't see it. I try to dress and behave in a way that's comfortable. I try to design a schedule that fits their schedules. I had to drive my teaching schedule all apart because so many of my students have children this semester and they're coming quite, in some cases, quite a distance. We had to juggle the class times around. and We try to create an environment where people can function. Uh, the, uh, then I want to be a, a resource, a model listener. We don't have many listeners, so my job is to listen. And if Minnie May were here, she perhaps would say what she has said so often. Uh, she is not only a companion and a friend, she is a wife. And she will point out that she has never heard anybody talk so much about listening. <laughs> but uh, as a teacher, I, I try to listen, try to shut up, try not to say too much, try to underteach. Now, all these responsibilities are not only explained the first day to the students, but at least on the third meeting and other meetings. I keep telling them the context of the course. I keep telling them why I underteach, why they're to make the first evaluation of their work, what they're doing and what I'm doing, what role I see for them, what role they see for me, and that they can challenge these roles and, uh, and enter into their own education. It's their own education. When I have a problem in a course, and this is a behavior that I would advocate at any level, when you have a problem in a course, you have a class meeting. You know, a lot of you are not writing stuff that's as interesting as I thought it should be. You don't seem to get topics, or you wonder what the value of writing is. Let's talk about that. Or you can't get started, or there's too much noise in the classroom for some of you to write, or the atmosphere is entirely too quiet, or whatever is going on that, that worries you, bring it up with the class. It is a writing community and these things can be talked about. Now let's look at the action of a conference which has almost infinite variations and I will end up talking about variations but I want to look very carefully at the basic design of the conference as I try to do it. Now we have about 64,000 writing conferences a year going on at the University of New Hampshire. Everybody takes freshman English, no exemptions on either end, no bonehead English, uh, no anything. We have a new honors English but everybody takes English and takes writing. Uh, and it's a one semester course, and so we have a lot of people teaching it, and not all of them teach this way, but all of them have conferences. We have advanced composition course, where all of them have conferences. We have advanced writing courses in which the nonfiction people have conferences every week. The fiction and poetry people do it a little differently, depending on which, who's doing it. They have generally have longer conferences less frequently. But my way is the way that's evolved for me, and it may change. First, the student comments on recent writing or the writing experience. Jim made the first comments on what, what was going on. They put the work in context, or what isn't coming or what is coming. They speak first. They know that they're going to do that, and they know why they're going to do it. Second, 
the teacher reads the paper or listens in the student's terms. Now, I tend a lot to read the papers out of class. Most of our people read the paper cold turkey at conference. Uh, I tend to, it be, just seems the way my courses are set up. I get the papers and I'm too curious about them. I try not to mark anything on them. And I try to read them superficially and quickly so I can listen to what the student is saying. Here you had a model of I listen to the paper, I would scan it or read it. And I'm looking in terms of the student's thing. Now there are things I could say about that first poem. And there were points where I was confused in that first poem. And when you get confused as a teacher, you wonder if you're going to pass the quiz. You know, and do, could I really analyze that poem? Do I know everything was going on? Is everything clear exactly to me? No. But the, the issue was there, can the student be taken seriously as a poet? Now, if I didn't think the student could be, there are things I could say that would allow me to support the student but not encourage more poetry. In this case, I'd encourage more poetry, but I don't think it's the time to be critical. I'm going to have the student for the whole semester. If I can keep my mouth shut, we're going to get some stuff and I'm going to be involved in that way. So you read the paper and you respond in the student's terms. Whatever that is, I want careful editing, maybe messing around in that second version. I probably would have taken the student in the normal thing and started playing with that poem if the student would let me right there with the student there. And the student would have taken the text back, said, I, you're not getting this right. And I'd say, exactly. <laughs> you're the one that knows what you want to say. The student invites further response from the student. What do you, how do you intend to do it? What do you like best about the paper? What surprised you? Uh, what do you need to do next? In one of my articles, I have a list of questions that I evolved. The, the, uh, the more that you evolve those questions for the student, the less you have to use them, but I think it's important to come out. But uh, some of the favorite ones of mine are what surprised you in this? What do you intend to do next? What do you think works best? What needs work? What do you feel like working, working on now? How does this fit into your history as a writer? I, in other words, how does this fit your goals? Or are you making a step forward or not? And look at, or, and I may intervene and say, look at what you can do. Do you realize what you can do now that you couldn't do in September or whatever? The thing, putting it in the context. And ask the student, this is often doesn't need to be asked explicitly, but if it doesn't, what do you intend to do next? Uh, what's going to happen next? Okay. Now this whole uh, system, and I've missed saying something important I want to delay about why I do some of this, we'll get to that. The workshop, uh, small group or class workshop builds on the same model. I don't have workshops until I have had a few conferences and have modeled the behavior I like in the conference of helpful behavior. When we have a workshop, we ask the student, how can we help you? The purpose of the small group or large group workshop is to not to be a test of walking on fire or that kind of thing that many graduate writing programs have evolved where the student does not speak and the student is attacked and the student shows their macho toughness. It's no mistake that these programs have all been established by men. And it's a very macho locker room, football playing, paratrooper experience and I never got screwed around with because I had played football and was in the paratroops. And that dynamic was the thing that made me feel least comfortable about workshops when I came to teach. Because I thought a lot of idiotic things had been said and I didn't know how to change the climate until several things happened to me that caused me to say, hey, wait a minute, this is something that, that the one thing that I was in a workshop conference with Don Graves and that group where I got attacked for the way I'd begun an article and, uh, and I defended my beginning of that article for two hours and was very angry at everybody when I left and not very helpful. And I realized later, about four days for the adrenaline to simmer down, if somebody had said to me, what's your problem with the piece? How can we help you? I would have said, I've tried to start this 30 different ways and it doesn't work. But I wasn't allowed to say that and so wang, I was in there. So I went back and uh, and started workshops saying, how can we help you? And immediately students started making comments. Well, I wonder if it's clear, if it's well organized, is this a poem? Are those lines there? Do you know if this has happened? Would this convince you that abortion is good or bad? Or whatever is, is the issue on or off the page that, that we read our texts in workshop on the basis. Sometimes this semester, I'm asking my students to do that in writing, that they pass their paper out in workshop with a statement at telling how we can help. 
and the students read the paper and I read the paper on this instruction. Usually I find with my students' papers, because I was an English major, the 30 or 40 things wrong. I can take my favorite authors, a Joan Didion or, you know, or any number of other people and find all these things wrong with them. I've been trained to do that. I certainly can with my own copy and I certainly can with students. What I want to know is what the student's ready to learn at that time. Okay. What was the time of this conference? Did you? Which, which one? All, all three of them. What was the first one? Four minutes. Four minutes was the first conference. Second one was four. Four minutes. The second and the third one was seven. Third one was seven minutes. Now, I would not have guessed that that long, other one was as long. I would have guessed that they were under five minutes because of my experience. Now, I'm not advising that you have a four-minute conference or a two-minute or a seven-minute conference, but I'm trying to say that this is a practical teaching device. The more frequently you see the students, the, more, the easier it is to have shorter conferences. You're dealing with one thing. For public school teachers in particular, I've got the chart here as one way to begin if you want to try to do this with the realistic loads that you have. The way I would plan is to put down the board as I did the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm assuming here a 50 minute class period. So I run down the left, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25, and so on to 50 minutes. First three days are days where the students are writing and conferring. In the beginning, uh, now I've got 25 students in the class, and uh, so I get a few extra periods. If I had 27 students, it would be different. If I had 30 students, I might decide to do four minute times and buy me. In other words, it's all adjustable. <laughs> if you have 20 students, it'll be different. If you have 35 students, it'll be different. If your class period's 40 minutes or 70 minutes as it was in one school system I was in, it would be different. What I've decided here is to take 10 minutes for a class meeting. I realize after I met with everybody last week that students are having some trouble with organization. <laughs> It's about two-thirds of the way through the course, and I might pass out a handout and say, if you're having some problems with organization, here's the way to do this. And, the, and that if you remember, Jeff and Julie have had problems with organization and solved it, so they're resources as well as I am in the class. And we also remember have that handout on the board of how one of the writers did that organization. A quick class meeting, then they are writing, and I go around, or they come to me, and I see eight students that day. Now, once you've done this a few weeks, you'll find that you're spending, you know, 30 seconds with one student and eight minutes with another student. Or you have the four and seven minute range we had here. But in the beginning, it's good for you and the students to have a goal. Second day, you come in, have conferences. About the middle of the class, I realize something's going on here and that we need to think a little bit about some problem. And, uh, or better yet, somebody in the class has got one hell of a piece of writing. And I say, would you mind sharing that with the class? And the thing that might happen is I might say, you believe it, and depending how I knew Jim and in the class environment, and we got a poet in the class, and uh, he's agreed to, to made, have his first poetry reading, and, uh, and Jim would read a poem, and he'd sit down to thunderous applause, and we'd go back to writing. <laughs> and uh, we'd go along here, we'd have for more conferences. The next day, we'd have some other conferences. And I might have a meeting here and say, just reminding you, you're going to publish on Thursday. You've got to get your stuff ready and, uh, and remember about the semicolon or whatever it I think you should remember about. Uh, and uh, then on Thursday, everybody publishes. That means that they share in some way. Uh, they share in small group or or class group or copying in some ways or not, but they get some other readers uh, than, the, than the teacher. And what happens here is that the students are either writing or doing their homework, then doing their writing at home or reading or conferring with each other or doing whatever behavior is appropriate in this three times to the level of students grade 7 or grade 11 or grade 16 or whatever that's, that's there. In, 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 in whatever level you will accept. Now, if you want to learn how to do this, you first have to go to elementary school teachers. We all know that it starts out with the kindergarten teachers being best, and the first grade teachers are just a little less best. And it starts going directly down until it gets to the university teacher. Uh, and so go down to the elementary school and talk about classroom management. 
People in the elementary school know how to manage a class. English professors that you've had do not. So you go to them. You go to shop teachers, home ec teachers, art teachers, music teachers, phys ed teachers, and they tell you how to manage this. As I visit lots of classrooms at different levels doing this, I am absolutely amazed how much noise and intervene, how much action you tolerate is what you tolerate. The most important thing is the thing for the teacher to be comfortable. There is no level on this that anybody needs to worry about, but I've got to be comfortable to function. I was not a permissive parent. I was a freelancer. My kids were young. They did not answer the phone and laugh and hang up and lose three semesters of groceries or something. I went one year 11 months with no income waiting for that call and you don't let the kids mess around with the telephone you know I mean but somebody else have kids answering the phone all the time that's fine that's their house and my house is one way my classroom I put an environment which I can function the kids can function and sometimes it's very quiet and sometimes it's noisy then they publish then fr Friday they respond revise and edit responding to what happened to the publication what they learned from their readers and they put their paper in their folder this is a, a pattern, not the pattern, but it is practical to do this. Now, what has happened in the conference and in this pattern? What's happened with Jim? First thing that's happened is it, that Jim has written, and he has read what he has written. Uh, I mentioned to at least one of you, some of you are looking for dissertation topics, enough dissertation topics in this area for everybody in the whole room. Uh, we have a situation where a lot of students are not readers, but are good writers. And we don't, but the kind of reading you do while you're writing is enormously sophisticated. To write some of that poetry, Jim has to read what hasn't yet been written, as demonstrated in the last conference. He has to read what is being written, which changes the meaning and the language and everything. He has to read what's going to be written. And kids can do this at every level. And a lot of them do it well, and we don't know what they're doing. Reading research doesn't help us a bit. Critical analysis of literature and the critical modes do not help us a bit. We need to look at those good students and good writers and see how they read because you cannot write without reading. As, put, as soon as you put X in the dust, you read X. You, you have to be a reader if you're a writer. You can be a reader and not write, but you cannot be a writer and not read. So what does he has written and he has read in a very sophisticated way? The student has evaluated the writing. Gee, I don't know what I'm a poet or not. You know, I don't know if this has worked. I don't know what I got here. You know, suddenly I went out to buy a lion and I came home with a giraffe. What is it? The student has discovered what the student knows. If you were to ask me what I teach, and I had to answer in one word, I teach my students what they know. And I want to repeat that. I teach my students what they know. This changes your whole feeling about being a professor. What do I profess? I profess that my students know more than they know. More than I know, you see. The student knows the subject. It took me a long time. For about 10, 11 years, I learned that the student knows the subject better than I do. You know, Jim's writing about his mother, his life, his world, part of Missouri I've never been in. You know, and he knows that better than I do. And no matter what the subject is, in my case, the student knows it better than I do. If you're teaching literature, that may not be true. We could debate that whether the student knows the text better than you. I think I, you think you know which side I came down on, but it gets kind of complicated. I'm not talking about teaching a literature class. I'm talking about teaching a writing class. The student knows the subject. The student knows the process better than I do. A most of the stuff in my books is stolen from students. I remember Lucy Calkins telling how in a magazine writing course she organized her nonfiction. We all sat there spellbound and we learned about her card system and how she did this. You ask your students to teach you and to teach the class what they know. But they know what they did on the draft. They know whether they almost ran into a truck or whether they were written by hand or why they chose to do what they did. Students are always doing dumb things, but they are not doing them out of dumbness. They're doing them out of previous instruction or out of logic. And when I'm working with professionals on newspapers, it's just as true. Students are following previous instruction, either accurately or misconstruing it. One student on a newspaper 
had a paper that was very bumpy. I couldn't figure out these papers and the student couldn't. And finally, uh, in, in talking to the student, not saying, you turkey, why did you do this? The student said, well, you know, one thing I don't like, this student was making about 42000 a year, uh, saying, uh, you know, that, that I'm supposed to put in a quote every third paragraph. And I looked at the pieces, and all his pieces had a quote every third paragraph, it's like writing in a corduroy road. Uh, so we solved that. Uh, I said, who said that? And he told me, and I suspect that idiot on the city desk that night had said that. But it isn't true, and uh, sometimes it's a case of logic. If a student wants to write for the general public, for a lot of people, the student becomes vague and general and abstract. We all know this. You don't say to the student, you're, you're dumb. We say to the student, that's good thinking. That's really good logical thinking. It happens that most writers find that isn't true. And that the way to, one of the magic of writing is the more specific you are, the more concrete, the more readers you'll get. Why don't you experiment with that technique that some of us have discovered and see whether it works in the class. Publish both of these and see which, which one gets people involved, you know. It's not that the student has thought badly, that the student has thought well and come to, the, to a conclusion that isn't, doesn't work. The student in this process of questioning discovers that he or she can identify and solve writing problems. I've had to stop my advanced nonfiction course this semester and start over for a lot of the class. They have, two of them have had instructors that did not stay for, with us very long. Two brilliant women, writers, journalists, and they, uh, I asked, uh, you know, about leads. I said, uh, have you written many leads? And they said, no, and their leads are pretty bad. And I said, why don't you write a number of leads? My students in journalism class write 15 to 20 leads on every story. And they have lots of experience in writing leads, the first sentence, the first paragraph, the first line. And they pop these up like this, and they can make a lot of choices. An interesting exercise to do with every kind of writing. And I found out, they said, they, what did you do in Leeds? And they said, well, my instructor was really brilliant. She could tell me 10 or 12 or 15 leads in my stories, just like that. And she could write them right in the air. And they were clear, and they were good. And they were. This is a top flight journalist. But the fact that she, the instructor, could do it doesn't help the student. My students from my class have no idea whether I can write 15 or 20 leads on a story but they know they can write 15 to 20 leads in every story they've written. And that's what we have to do is to make that they have to find out they can identify and solve their writing problems. They need to know what works and they need to know what needs work. Let's go through the handout that I've given you to make things that I want to end up with very specifically. <laughs> if you want to get it out, fine. If you don't want to get it out, fine. <laughs> But I wrote this for you to try to get to some of the kinds of details. Uh, it was given out to everybody. I'm sure you can get some extra copies from Jim if you've lost them or dogs eaten them or something. Uh, we start out with, with some assumptions. Writing is the act of using written language to discover, record, and share meaning. Reading is a, writing is a thinking activity. The second one attempts, and I'm not going to just read these to hit some of the things, writers know what they do when they do it. They don't act out of perversion, out of laziness, out of ignorance, out of unpleasantness to make your life more difficult. Uh, they are making logical, rational decisions that are often wrong. But they are making decisions. They know what they did. It is an intellectual act. It is not a mysterious thing of throwing mud against a wall or something. This is a, a very highly sophisticated act, even in the first or second grade. They know what they do, did, and they can tell you. Even they don't know they were making a decision, but they can recreate it. They're individual, and they work individually, and the individuality changes with their experience with a writing task, uh, with a different writing task. When I first started to write memos as an administrator to a dean, when I became department chairperson, I had to learn a new kind of fiction writing, <laughs> and it became very easy after a while. But it wasn't at first. You change according to the task, and it changes according to your personality. I used to do a lot of revision. Now I do very little revision. It's a different time in my writing experience. Students learn best when they make their own meaning, when the writing is important to them, when they have to find out something, when they have to know about their mother and why they haven't written about their mother. That's the point. When they're able to touch that Civil War memento 
and make that connection, and they have to do it, that's when you start to get good writing. The students can tell you what they have done. They know the subject, the process, and what needs to be done better than the instructor. They know this better. My students are better at this than I am. And my job is to make them realize it. Okay. The pedagogy, they produce a text. We should remember that the first texts are often more like Jim's last uh, conference. They're off the page or partly off and on the page. And we have to learn to help them read the fragments in their head and the fragments on the page. The genre will evolve from the meaning. Most of us have restrictions that are idiotic, the same way I mentioned you can't write fiction or poetry in freshman English. Uh, I'm less patient with this kind of idiocy. Uh, one of the big debates on our campus is the role of narrative. Uh, I do not understand why my literature colleagues who are drawn into the teaching of literature because they want to be writers and because they read stories are so upset about narrative. They feel narrative is an inferior intellectual activity. They ought to go try to write a novel. I think that it's more sophisticated. Anybody can write poetry, can write anything. Anybody can write narrative, can write anything but poetry. Corporations go to people like myself and get them to write for me and politicians and ghostwrite because I write fiction and poetry. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the way the world is, and literature people seem to think that writing a paper critical analysis is intellectually superior to the creating the poem or the story. It is not. <laughs> he said discreetly. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think the genre should arise from the need, from the need to say something and from the audience. The student initiates the teaching by making first evaluation of the text. You meet with your classmate and with other people. The students teach the teachers. If my, my instructors that are going out for the first time or people that are suddenly going to say, I've got to teach composition differently, where do you learn this? Where do I get those books by Graves and Murray? Well, they're second or third or fourth on the list, I'm afraid. Hope my publishers don't hear this. Now, the first person to teach you is your best students in your class. And any student, whether you're learning, learning disabled students, students that are declared retarded or terminal, the term we use in New England, terminal. <laughs> 14 years old and you're terminal. That's a wonderful term. Since I flunked out of high school, dropped out two years and flunked out finally, I get very angry about this kind of declaring terminal. We'll identify with a lot of this, but at any given class, I wasn't doing well in English, incidentally, when I was dropping out of school, I was working on newspapers and publishing and stuff. <laughs> but I didn't fit very well. I was also a compulsive reader. I read Lorna Doon the first night it was given to me. I didn't much like it, but we had an English teacher who gave us quizzes, and if we knew the answers to some of the questions, it would indicate we read the whole thing. We'd read the Shakespearean play. I'd take book home and read it all night if necessary, because I was a book reader. But I would get penalized. Wonderful, wonderful. Good old days. Don't any of you who are younger uh, feel guilty about this uh, good old days business. Uh, education is better now than it was when I went to school by thousands of percent. <coughs> students will teach you, the good students in the class will teach you how they have been good at that level. How they are able to find subjects, how they are able to be fluent how they're able to make changes that are necessary, how they're able to reach audiences, how they get voice in their text. Ask them, and they'll find out they know and they'll tell you and the other people. The student who doesn't write an effective test, text is asked, what are you gonna do next? What are you gonna do about this? And they find out that they got solutions. It's disorganized, maybe I'll make an outline. There's all the difference in the world between you saying do an outline arbitrarily and the student saying, you know, I wonder if an outline would help here. You say, well, try it, <laughs> and it may well help. I hope that I modeled the next little bit here this morning. Hope so. If I didn't pay attention to what I say, not what I do. <laughs> By respectful and intense listening, the instructor convinces the students they have something to say, a language and rhetoric with which to say it, a knowledge of subject matter and writing process, and ability to identify writing problems and solve them. By respectful and intense listening, that's what I want, want to do. Okay, well, what do students know? One well, listed a few things here, not all of them. Their 
subject, why they chose their subject, the process of selecting the subject, the context of the subject, their opinion of the subject, their feelings about the subject, what they know, what they need to know, what others need to know, how they have found information about the subject, how they may be able to find more information, how they have written in the past, their purpose in writing the draft, what writing decisions need to be made, what writing decisions have been made, what writing decisions have not been made, how the draft was written, how it felt to write the draft, who or what is involved in the subject, who is affected by the subject, who or what influences the subject, what form or genre may contain the subject, what problems face the writer, what solutions may solve those problems. You know, I don't come to the writing conference feeling that I have to be full of myself and full of knowledge because that would unbalance the thing. That would really screw it up. I've got to be empty, if anything. I've got to be receptive. I've got to be quiet. I've got to be calm. I've got to get out of them what they know because they know so much that they don't know. To what does the teacher respond? To what the student says? The teaching point does not come so much from the text but from the student's response to the text. I am very little these days paying much attention to the student's text. That's a confession. I feel uncomfortable about that. Last semester in one news writing course, I paid less and less attention to the text, enormous attention to what the students were saying about the text. And I didn't say much in response to them, and it worried me. I talked it over with Minnie May, talked it over with some colleagues and Don. The thing that was confusing me was that I had 18 students and 16 of them were publishing every week because I was able to get out of their way and I wasn't teaching them stuff I had always had to teach before. Kind of confusing, isn't it? <laughs> so what was I doing? I was monitoring their reading of the text. What I teach is my students how to read their text so that they can make the next draft better or the next piece of writing better. I monitor their reading and help them read it in a productive way. Not, Jesus, this is a pile of crap. Or this is really great, you know? <laughs> but usually not praise or criticism, but just an intelligent reading of the text. My students are reading and I'm listening to their reading. In some cases, reading their reading because I may have them write about their text or fill out a questionnaire. Shut up and expect confidence in the student, faith in the student, respect for the student by a calm expectation. So that's what I was trying to do here. Ridiculous thing this morning in front of millions of people, there seems at least one million in this room and millions somewhere else. And I imagine those people, my own paranoia, that are on the other end of television or whatever downstairs, double over the laughter saying, look at him, you know. <laughs> What's he know? You know, he doesn't teach first grade. Doesn't teach in my junior high school, by God. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I, I have that kind of problem, but I have to be calm and see what Jim will say. I have much to say. Shut up and be calm. It is hard at first to have faith in these students in this class. Certainly not snut-nosed Jeremiah, certainly not snooty Jane. Well, there's something to say that's valuable, but he comes easier with experience because, surprise, they do. And after you've had a few start making perception, you look at a piece of paper and you say, I don't know what this is all about. I don't know what I can say to this pile of garbage, not the internal language. Holy cow. What is this, you know? Finnegan's Wake has come to my classroom. <laughs> I didn't do well with that back in college. Uh, see? But then I say to the student, what, what is this? What are you doing? In a way that's not threatening. I found out, for example, one of my colleagues sent a student to me. He had a new level of literary criticism in sophomore class. And he said, you specialize in this. Will you look at this paper? And it was something special. And I said to the students, what are you doing? What course are you taking? And they said to take of course, of Professor Rex, the smartest man I ever knew in my life. He has all these hidden meanings. He finds these hidden meanings all over the place. And it's wonderful. I love his classes. And gee, that's great. You got a lot of hidden meanings. Uh, now, how'd you go about writing his paper? Well, I wrote a paper about Joseph Conrad, the secret share. It's the first time I had any idea that the paper was about that. And he went through and took out any specific references to the author or the text. <laughs> it was nothing but hidden meanings <laughs> in no context whatsoever. And Professor X was not impressed and was startled by this thing he had. And, uh, and so we got some of that put back in and it went along. So what do you respond? You respond to all sorts of things. The, the writer's evaluation of draft, the writer's statements about writing, the writer's opinion of ability. I'm not going to read all those to you. There's a lot of things. You respond to what the writer says. 
How do you respond? You respond as a reader. You respond as a fellow human being. If you notice, and this wasn't set up because I had no idea what was saying, but I interrupted and intervened to say I was sorry that his mother had been taken to the hospital. And there's a higher order here. I don't have to deal with a semicolon first. You deal with what, the human aspect, and then you go on from there. You respond with honesty, and you respond with your heart as much as your head. Obey your instincts. You know, that's the thing. You, you, you wouldn't be here if you weren't pretty special. You wouldn't, I mean, you know, if you were going into it for money, and you're here, you're crazy, and <laughs> worry about you. But uh, this is a vocation, and it doesn't attract the worst people in the world. Department divides what we think sometimes in department meetings. You got pretty good instincts. You're interested in students and you're interested in writing and so on. You know, obey those, those instincts. And then there is no one way to respond to a student. I've listed a few here, only 70. A couple I'll mention and then I'll shut up. Stafford, Bill Stafford once said to me, and he said this now, I've heard it in public, but he, uh, lucky to hear it first time, he said, well, what you need as a writing teacher is a good, mm-hmm, ah, uh, mm, mm, my, yeah, okay, got to develop those. I hear you going around the rest of the day going, mm-hmm, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, you respond, number nine, by putting the student's paper in context. Boy, you didn't know you were a poet in September, did you? You know, kind of thing. By editing, in number 12, a section of the paper in conference. Uh, if you get a really good paper, and you can see some alternative ways of doing it, the student seems to be at a kind of plateau, you say, as I did to Jim, do you mind if I mess around with this? And the student may say yes or no. And I start to make some editing with the student there, not somewhere in a dark room somewhere, and then hit the student with this paper. I do it with a the student there. I wonder what would happen if you do this. I usually try to do two or three different things. I'll try to make, I'll use a verb that's stronger and a verb that's weaker. I'll make the sentences shorter and then hook them together and make them longer, big, big question marks in the margin. So there's not just one way. But I start messing around with it. And the student enters into this and says, well, that's not the way it is. That's not the way it was. And then I say, of course. That's why you've got to do the revision. And I'll help you show you some of these tricks. But I don't have, in my mind's eye, that vision that you're doing, or in my mind, I don't have the idea that you're developing, the concept, or I don't, I'm not a computer major, a computer science major, or a business major. I can't tell you what the conclusions are in this report. 19, by inviting the student to give an account of how the piece was written. Very important to do that. I'd like to know how you write this piece. If the student is very good, you will learn. If it's a disaster, you'll probably find out the student worked at it in a very logical way. And that you can find out and perhaps suggest some other ways. 21, by making the student, asking a student what has surprised him or her during the writing. I do play on this idea of surprise, that students are learning while they're writing. And I ask them to tell me what they've learned during their writing. And uh, that usually is quite exciting to them. They may not have realized they learned something asking the student what the student intends to do next. It's their course. They're setting this up. They're going to work on something next. I put 24 in by saying so because Tom Riegstad did his dissertation on writing conferences and I was one of the people he taped and I am never conscious of having said so in my life but there on the tape was so. <laughs> Seemed to work. I got answers. So. <laughs> 31, by suggesting the student publish outside of class, in a newspaper, in a publication, sending it off to an editor, or making a complaint, sending a A student who has published walks differently. I can tell my students who have published for the first time by the way they walk down the corridor to my office. They come and they say, I've published. I say, I know. <laughs> walk differently when you publish. 40, by referring the student to classmates who have dealt with similar subject matter or solved similar writing problems. I might get Jim to work together with somebody else in the class who's lost a grandmother or had somebody in the hospital written about that or somebody who has written poetry or is interested in it. 
44 and 45. By suggesting the student loosen up and make writing play, by suggesting the student tighten, tighten up and make writing work. <laughs> one of the papers you gave me, Sandra, I had one of that, hey, Don, like, man, you know, uh, he needs a little tightening up, man. <laughs> and a couple other ones, I think I'd say, hey, loosen up. Uh, you know, there's no right or wrong. You're, you're talking with human beings. Some people need to get more organized, and some people are prisoners of their own organization. 46 and 47, by suggesting the student lower his or her standards. What do you do about writer's block? Bill Stafford's got the answer. Lower your standards. The only real cause for a writer's block is you're writing to impress somebody. You know, I want Cleo Martin to read this in order to say that's okay, it's at least B minus and passing the course. And I have my own instructors and my own audience. And when I start to think that I want to impress somebody, and Cleo is one of the people I want to impress, then the text goes to pieces, or no text exists at all. I have to lower my standards until I can function, then send it off. But 47, by suggesting the student raise his or her standards, I certainly have some students that need standards a little higher than the ones they're doing. You do this individually with the student, not with everybody at the same time. 53, by listening to the student's speech patterns, I learn an awful lot by watching a student's body language, which is interpreting what they're saying to me, and listening to their speech patterns. The student that comes in says, well, I don't know, I had a lot of time writing this last night, didn't, didn't go too well. Uh, in New England, we can really speed up the language sometimes. Like the, and quite often, that sped up language like this is on the text, and their sentences are colliding like, or piling up like train wrecks. Um, not all the time. Uh, but. Listening to the way a person speaks often gives me a clue to how they write. They are hearing their writing, they are writing with their voice and that. By connecting writing problems, solutions, and process with an activity in which the student is familiar, they should be an authority. You've gotten a student that's doing laboratory experiments. Right? There is a natural connection between the writing process and the scientific process. A writing course is a laboratory course. Every writing is an experiment in meaning, and most experiments fail and have to fail. A student that's playing football, you talk about practice. A student that's a music major, you talk about practice. A student that's a, that, you know, whatever you go, play, drama. Have the students bring their experiences in. If somebody's in a play, have them talk about rehearsal and how does that relate to the writing process. If somebody's an art major, have them come into class and do a drawing and show how they do that. Or I've had students come in and, and compose songs or bring in songs that they composed and stomach a cigar, you know, do it. They, they, they teach things. I've had one wonderful, exciting things that you have in, in classes is, is uh, I had a student, big student, made me feel small. I like those students, many of them. And uh, he uh, had to leave class every once in a while on a special call because he'd expect, he's an expert in, in French, Polish, and Iron, Iron, Irish in bombing. And most undertakers these days don't do their own embalming, and you have specialists. And here he was in class, so he wrote about that and educated the class to the process of embalming while they turned slightly green. <laughs> but uh, you have students that are uh, one little mild, meek lady, uh, 21 years old, sitting down the other end of the table. Had We had to have all our conferences uh, by phone. We couldn't meet because her schedule and mine didn't conflict. She not only was teaching flying, but flying commercial planes at night, so she'd fly out to Des Moines with some checks in a plane, something like this to a bank, and then fly back to New Hampshire and come to class. Connecting what they know and what they're on with the kind of writing problems they're having. 57, by inviting a student to fill out a questionnaire before a conference. I stole uh, the idea from Janet Emig and have the way an example in a writer teaches writing, but uh, uh, recently I've found it helpful to sometimes some courses to have the students answer some questions about the piece, what they think works, what needs work, how do they intend to work on it, who they'd like to have read it, what, whatever is appropriate to that course and that level, as a way of stimulating stuff before the conference that we can look at together. And finally, 70, but not the end by any means we could go on, by asking the student to help the instructor solve a writing problem. And many of my students have helped me with my writing. And this leads to that business of, we were mentioning, uh, I think it was Mr. Lyons at, uh, at the breakfast today, that it's what marvelous work that many students are doing with overhead projectors or on Blackboard, having the students help them with their, write, their own writing and have students suggesting how text can be changed. All of this is a bunch of nuts and bolts coming out of, of one rather simple theory. 
and that is that our job is to do responsive teaching. We are not initiators, we are not beginners, we are not people who have knowledge that we would pour into empty vessels. If our students are coming to us in first grade, they're coming with years of language experience and every grade after that. And our job is to find out where they are and to listen to them and help them keep moving forward. So, thank you very much. Supposed to go on next. <laughs> well, there is time for questions. Fine. Up to you. If there are questions, I'll be glad to answer them best I can. Been very patient in a long time in a hot room. You may not have any. <laughs> hmm? There's a question. Okay. How do you begin with an opening class? I think there are a lot of different ways, but I think that the best way and the more remedial the class, or in Jimmy Britton's terms, the less, the less they expect to write, is to get them to write. And I would write on the board or in my own writing for long enough to get something down, which usually averages about four or five minutes. I don't want it very long. I sometimes use it three by five cards because it keeps it manageable. And uh, I write and they write and then I share my writing first because if I'm going to ask my students to show them their writing, they better see my writing. And so I share my writing with them and then we go around and everybody shares their writing. If somebody doesn't have any uh, or doesn't, chooses not to, I don't initiate that as a, as a possible out. But if they are obviously uncomfortable, we go on to the next person. And we hear the writing, we don't see the handwriting, we don't see the spelling, we don't see the punctuation, we don't see the sentence fragments, which incidentally are English minor sentences now. <laughs> we, uh, we hear the voices and the class transforms right then and there from a group of students who are expecting an authority to a community of people who have potential. And it takes patience because the, uh, I did a different kind of thing, but an exercise like this the other day in class and this week and uh, got way around before there was anything very good. And I got to be calm <laughs> and expect and listen and I get rewarded. I've never struck, an out, struck out. I mean, the class has always come through, but certainly not the first papers and not the 10th one and not the 12th one and not the 13th one. So that's the way, if there is a way to start. I mean, I do different things. and. But that's the, the a way that I suggest as the best way to start. And that's the way I start with most workshops, when working with teachers, as you go out and work with teachers to get them right first. We did that the other day. We just, today, the, the numbers defeated me. But in that case, you do a demonstration or something that gets involved in the act. You don't talk at them. You try at least to get them involved, and I hope by Jim's cooperation, we got you involved. You demonstrate, you participate, you get into the act of learning yourself. That's fine. I have a question. Yeah. Um, during your action of conference, you said the student speaks first and knows why. Yeah. What, what do you tell them? Why? Do oh, I say in class that they know what they're writing about. Oh, okay. And they know how they've written that draft. And I may get anecdotal in my own experiences that um, I found as a writer that editors are constantly saying to me that I wish you'd spend more time on this the way you did on X, you know. And I know that I wrote X first draft under the worst conditions and spent no time whatsoever. And the piece they think that was rushed may be a fifth or sixth draft. And the students seem to recognize in their own experience that their own writing in school that the judgments teachers have made have also doesn't reflect what they went through to produce it. And so they, they can understand that they know what decisions they made and they know their subject and their job is to teach me the subject 
and to tell me how they wrote it, and my job is to help them do an increasingly better job. But I can't presume to imagine, I'm always amazed, but picking a writing staff is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> interesting as Cleo knows. I have people come to me and say, I want to teach with you in freshman English, let's say. Uh, I know exactly what those students need, and I have an approach that really has worked for me, and, uh, and I know what they need to do next September, and uh, boy, uh, they, they have struck out because uh, they're too smart for me. I, <laughs> I have no idea what my students are going to need in another class next September. My classes are different. My students are different within a class, and so I try to find out. And I explain this to them the first day. Now, most students, whatever you explain the first day, doesn't they're so confused, particularly if they're freshmen. And so I repeat it several times. <laughs> and I'll repeat it in conference. Students will come in and they won't know what's expected of them, and I will repeat it again. You know. I want to hear from you, you know. Uh, students uh, can't, uh, students abhor uh, a vacuum. And uh, if you give a students a little room, give them a little silence, they'll fill it up, you know. If you don't talk first, it's amazing what'll happen. How do you help students develop attitude skills? Uh, when they have something written that they're proud of, when they have something to say, when they're proud of the message, and when there is a real occasion to publish it, to share it within or better yet outside the class, then they, we can work on what editing skills they need to know. The interesting thing is, is how language breaks down for the writer. The most important breakthroughs I make is when, I'm, when, when my syntax is breaking down. And uh, the biggest problem I probably have, the two student types that are most difficult to deal with is the excessively fluent student, the glib student. At teaching at a university, I like English majors least and philosophy majors next least. Engineering, our best writers usually come from our agricultural school, really, that's no, no joke, this is the real thing. They, uh, there's the people that just can turn the stuff out and are some of the engineering type students who are following rigid rules right along, you know. They're taking Warner and actually practicing it and they're writing badly because of it. Uh, so you have that kind of, of, of problem. With those students, you have to get them to, to loosen up and be unaware of editing skills. And the other ones, you have to help them be clear at the end. But most drafts start clearing themselves up as they go along. Um, I'm interested a, out here in Ohio, uh, uh, in just a little bit east of here. <laughs> uh, there's a... a Franciscan who taught uh, in a Franciscan school and, and the, the Cincinnati province goes down through the southwest and includes the Philippines so we'd have a lot of Navajo and Philippine students and he found out that even language problems with serious language problems people that are not native English speakers the, a lot of things solve themselves as you become confident you can make anybody inarticulate in their language by putting pressures on them you can let them become more competent by taking pressures off. And then you identify those skills. If we have students that from a French-Canadian speaking home in my area, you will finally identify certain patterns with certain students, and then you can say, hey, you've got to deal with that. Uh, and I teach the editing school, the, you know, you have materials. Sometimes I will hand out workbooks to certain students or handbooks. They have to be there. I'm going to do a handbook myself. There are things you need to know. But I don't think you can learn that until you have a message and until you have an audience. And so I try not to worry about it and, and try to manipulate the student, if that's the right word, into having an audience once they have a message. But then, then it's done pretty mechanically, you know. It's, it's to make the meaning clear. But I think we learn those rules sh only should be taught in terms of meaning. And I think to turn it around the other way, to say that those of us who teach this way are not teaching language and teaching grammar uh, is false. Every conference, when you're reading your student's work and trying to understand it, you are... You know, if, if the pronoun reference is such that you don't know whether Jim is referred to his mother or his tractor, you know, <laughs> you've got a pronoun reference problem, and, and you can deal with that. Sometimes I do that with handouts and pronoun references. Passive voice, say, here's a handout. You know, once the student sees how that has affected
expected meaning, but I think it needs to be taught in the context of meaning individually. Or a class meeting, I find that if if 30% of my class is having a problem, then, it's, then I have a class meeting on that. And my teaching goes according, I see all of my students every week in conference, so I don't decide what I'm gonna do in the next class. I don't know what I'm gonna do on Thursday, because Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'll be meeting with all my students. And Thursday night, I'll have a pretty good idea of what I need to do on Thursday. So that's, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what this class needs this Thursday, but I will. <laughs> and it may be editing skills, so we have an editing session. Okay. Thank you very much.